Have you ever noticed how fine detailing on a sewing project can make it gorgeous? Something as simple as the way a collar fits can move your garment into the exceptional category. Today, we're going to share with you some simple sewing tricks. Collar and knit magic will unfold right before your eyes. Hand embroidered flowers will be enchanting. We've come to my sewing room today to have fun, and I'm honored that you're here. I'm so happy to have as my guest today, Louise Cutting. Louise is president of Cutting Corners, and she is a representative of Rowenta Irons. Louise, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Martha. It's wonderful to be here. I think we're going to talk about this before you show our viewers how to do it. We're going to talk about collars today. Collars, okay. And that particular collar, I have rolled the seam. There is no seam on the short front end. Right here. That always causes, causes bulk in the corners. What has happened is I have rotated Let the seam turn around, Louise. to be underneath the under collar in the center back. And it's going to do all kinds of magical things. But we have to change the pattern to create that. And okay. you can do it with just about any pattern that is out there that has a regular conventional collar. And I want to show you the different steps um, as to how you would change your collar. If you have a collar pattern piece that looks like this, now if you have multiple sizes, you're going to have to draw in your 5 8 inch center front seams because you're going to need that. You can do a copy of it so that you have a secondary Here's one, here's the other. On the second one, you need to add 5 eighths of an inch. This is going to end up being your back underneath seam allowance. So we have our collar. This is our 5 eighths seam allowance. We've married the two 5 eighths fronts, this one and this one over top of each other. And here's the fold line. So you're going to cut one pattern piece that has the fold here is the non-existent front edge where it doesn't have the seam anymore, and that's our back. So what happens with the collar is, here is our collar pattern piece, and you're going to cut it out and think that you've done something terribly wrong because <laughs> that is a very unusual looking collar. The whole thing has to be interfaced, both the upper and the under collar. Because you have no seam here, you have no place to stop your interfacing. So you want to use a lighter weight interfacing so that you have the upper and under collar interfaced. Here is your center back seam stitched at 5 eighths. It is trimmed to 3 eighths. And I'm going to remove this collar and show you how this changes. Here's our collar. We're just going to pull it so that turns into your center back seam. So now here would be those two front edges that now do not have seams. This would be pressed open, trimmed, and we're going to pin it going along the bottom. And that would be stitched. On this sample, we have stitched it. The edges are going to be trimmed trim the collar equal, and it will be placed over our, my very favorite piece of pressing equipment is the point presser. This seam would be pressed open. I'm going to just do the end here. Pressed open here, and with a point turner. This is my, the best one that I have found. It lays in your hand and this is not a point poker, it's a point <laughs> turner. The thumb goes up inside, the point goes right next to the edge, and this gets turned up and over so that you have a real fine point on your garment. And then this would be pressed. What happens is, I did one in stripes so that you could see. You did this and you didn't realize you did it. Here's our stripes, so our straight of grain is here. But what happens on the underside is it goes on the bias. 
And if you've done any kind of tailoring, the under collar is always placed on the bias because it wraps around the neck so much nicer. Well, here's our center back seam. You did nothing. All of a sudden, it created it all by itself. Now, when this is going to be stitched on the sewing machine and you wanted to do some edge stitching, I'm going to just demo here, you would be stitching right down to this point. The trouble is that point will go down into that oval throat plate. And I always call it a ball of spaghetti down underneath that you have this thread because it has nothing to turn on. Well, if you're stitching all the way down to this point and you pick up your presser foot and you turn, you have metal here and you have metal all the way down here, it has no traction. So you have a mirror image within the garment. Pick your other end up and stick it under the back end of the presser foot. Lower your presser foot down. You've now made your presser foot exactly the same level and you can turn and continue stitching all the way to the other end and do the same thing here. So this way you have a corner that doesn't get caught down in the presser foot and then gives you all that thread build up down in the corner. All you're doing is wherever you have a mirror image, find it and put it under the back end of the presser foot, lower the presser foot down and continue stitching. Oh, Louise, all your magic. That is absolutely wonderful. Thank you. You are welcome. And now Louise has some beautiful sewing inspirations to share with you. Okay, Louise, tell us about your ham. <laughs> <laughs> My ham, well-loved ham, lots, lots of age in that. This is the old-fashioned big hams, which I like. Um, what I do is I want to discipline the collar after I have sewn it. So I wrap it around, I find where my fold line is, my roll line on the collar, and I place it around the ham, I steam it, and let it sit overnight. And let me unpin this and look what happens. Here's your collar. Wow. So yeah. it knows exactly where it is supposed to roll that at all times. Fascinating. Can you get these hams this No, anymore? not or anymore. Make your, own you make your own and there are measurements um, that, and they have to be filled with cedar sawdust. Cause cedar Cedar sawdust. doesn't get moldy or mildew because there's so much steam that goes into these so that you have to use a cedar oh, sawdust. My mother always had one of those to sew with. Oh, Louise, now show us this beautiful. That is just oh, a real so pretty, pretty jacket, and I am the queen of miters. Everything is mitered on this. Even this was an unusual corner because this is not squared coming down here. And this is a tall funnel that can be done on any bias neck. All it is is 15 inches high, and you wear it. The way it falls over your head is the way you wear it, and it puts all kinds of pretty color up around your face and softens mm, wrinkles. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, we love wrinkles. <laughs> Again, Wonderful, these one seam pants. One seam pants. Again, cute, eight, cute eight buttonholes, about two inches apart, with the little tab running through them and just tied in knots again around the outside. Adorable. It can be drawn ever so slightly. Don't draw, draw it in too much, but it has a piece of fabric underneath to give you a little bit of support. These wonderful collars again, Louise. Wonderful collar. And this is, the whole thing is at odd angles. The hem is odd, shorter shoulder seam on this side, longer shoulder seam on that side. And wow. it's just, it just has such a pretty shape to it. And again, a wonderful Japanese print. This is just a real pretty shell. I've never been fond of that keyhole opening in the back that the only time you ever see it is in, you don't see it in ready to wear, you see it in patterns. Well, I designed this so that it has a little bit of interest detail so there's nothing in the back of the keyhole. So your opening, your opening your is, is here. Yes. How much, how much nicer. Yes. I don't care for that keyhole either. As you no. say, you never see it in ready to wear. No, you don't. Only, and so we like that. <laughs> And this is just a, also a great shape. Longer uh, in the back than the front and mitered corners, um, front, back, and sleeve, and stacked buttons. Absolutely two Bakelite, <laughs> Two Bakelite buttons, just Aww. one stacked on top Louise, of the other. thank you so much. You are welcome. For bringing all of your magic. And now I have a so easy trick for you.
I'm so pleased to have as my guest today my dear friend Sheila McNeely. Sheila is General Manager of Floriani Products, a division of RNK Distributing. Sheila, welcome to the show. And thank you for having me, Martha. I'd like to talk to you today about knits. It's one of the biggest challenges that people work with is stretchy and knit fabrics. Whether we're doing an 8,000 stitch design or maybe even a 36,000 stitch design, that being able to get the proper registration in doing so. So I have a couple of designs here to show you that if you look closely at this design here, you're going to see that the outline is off just a bit in stitching and we did not get this hooped in the proper manner or use the proper stabilizer. And if you look at this one, the outline is perfect every time. Again, we can look here, look how pretty this one lays. And then on this football, there is a cupping effect because there wasn't enough stabilizer used. When we're stitching, we can put 8,000 stitches in a um, knit with a regular cutaway uh, mesh. And I have prepared one here by ironing the mesh onto the garment to hoop it. And then we're gonna take our template and we want to do placement. We can have it in the hoop and cut this out so that we can put our design inside the hoop as we're trying to put this in place. So then we can get this lined up properly under our machine to go into the next step of stitching. Once we have stitched this, then we will um, put a interlining on the backside, a six-way stretch to keep it from being itchy to their skin. So that's the best way that we can, can hoop and stitch a knit design. And knits would terrify some people with machine embroidery, but with the proper stabilization, there's no reason to be terrified, is there? That is correct, Martha. Just use the proper stabilization, proper stabilization. and we are ready to roll. Oh, Sheila, thank you so much, because everybody just loves those little knit shirts and the cute little baby things. Thank you so much, Sheila. And thank now you. I have a sewing accessory idea to share with you. You are going to love this project. This is the coolest little project and the, it's just to be a wonderful gift. It's called a mending caddy. Now let me show you what it is. You see we have all these pretty things uh, machine embroidered on and I'm going to turn it over and let you see the back also. Then I want to hold this up so you can see it has spools of thread which are kind of permanently attached in there with elastic. I, you can use whatever colors that you use that you're going to need to do some hand mending with. Of course, I need to have some black and white in mine because I'm always having to sew a button on with black thread. But you see, you can keep this mending caddy right with you. And we have the machine embroidery and a button kind of does the tufting in the middle. Here's another version done out of different beautiful silk embroideries. And once again, isn't that wonderful that you have your um, spools of thread right there? And as you can see, it's on elastic. I'm going to show you how it's done. It's really easy. But this is a wonderful way to use your machine embroidery. I'm going to keep this one over here. Now, the first thing you're going to do is to cut your pillow, the little pill inside pillow, and mark whatever you want to mark and do your fancy stitching, your machine embroidery. Okay, here we go. Let me bring this here. You'll do your machine embroidery and your little quilting stitch and embellish it first and then put the back on it which is a self fabric and then I'm going to stitch all the way around it and turn it right side out and then we're going to stuff it. Pretend like we have all that extra machine embroidery there. Okay now the next thing we're going to do is to tuff the pillow. You know little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet. We have a um, tapestry needle threaded with silk ribbon. I'm going to go all the way through the pillow pull it through and that will give me a tufting and we'll come back and then I'm going to go back through one again once again and tie it. All right, here's our little pillow that has been tufted. You see it's been tied on the back. The next thing we're going to do is to use one of these uh, purchased uh, doilies. And this is just a really nice side. You see it has the little uh, overhang. That's where we're going to eventually hide our threads. Okay, so on the outside of the uh, hem stitching, and then sew on the inside of the hem stitching. So we're going to just have it 
really, really sewn down. Now, the next step is that we had some beautiful silk ribbon just kind of woven with a tapestry needle. You go under two, over two, under two, over two, under two, over two. That just adds a real nice touch. So I'm gonna weave the silk ribbon. Now remember, there's no padding or no stuffing in here, just two pieces of the silk of the uh, doilies. Now, let me show you the pillow again. Here is a little beautiful decorative trim that we used. And before we put the pillow in there, I come in on the flat surface and stitch this, again, mitering. You know what, I believe we put it on the outside. I'm sorry, stitch it on the outside, stitch it to the little doilies. It looks like it's attached to the pillow, but it isn't. After we stitch that to the doilies, then we put the pillow back in here. Hang on just one minute. We put the finished pillow back on the doilies and smush it down and hand whip that pillow in. All right, see, we've done that. And now then, here comes the fun part. I'm going to put whatever colors or spools of thread I want to use that I want to have just handy so I can have a little bit of hand mending. And I'm going to stitch down in the middle, corner, corner, in the middle, corner, corner, in the middle. And with a bodkin, I'm going to run some elastic and I'm going to just thread it right in here. Bring it out, tuck the, uh, well, I think I came through the back there, all right. I'm gonna bring it out, I'll get the thread tucked in, put another spool of thread, and I cannot think of any sewing lady that would not absolutely love this little mending. The mending pillow, it's a mending caddy, it's adorable. Let me turn over and show you the back, you see all the different colors of thread, and the ribbon, and it's just beautiful. Another perfect gift to make where you want to use your machine embroidery and have something absolutely wonderful that anybody would love to have. And now I have some hand embroidery, some very special hand embroidery for you. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today, my dear friend, Beverly Sheldrick. Beverly it has joined us again from the wonderful country of New Zealand. Beverly is a world-renowned embroiderer. She is a teacher at the Martha Pullen School of Art Fashion, and she is the teacher on two brand new silk ribbon embroidery DVDs. Beverly, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. It's always good to be here with you. Now, Martha, today, I'd like to talk to your viewers about pansies and daisies. Now, you may not think that they're related, but it's quite interesting because as far as silk ribbon is concerned, yes, they are. Now, <clears throat> they're both made up of straight stitches, but of course, like always, it's what we do with those straight stitches that makes the difference. So you will see here, I've actually got one drawn here, which shows the shape that I've got these two top, or I would call them a little pair of rabbit's ears. I've now got two side ones, which I've used a second color. These are not as long as those ones. Then the third one comes down here like this. And this, the bottom V is actually the longest of those six stitches. And then last but not, not least, you will see that we've got a little French knot, this time made in using um, a stranded cotton. Here we have our little daisy, which as you can see again, it's straight stitches, but they're all the same length. So to get an easy distribution, if you do the one, there's your little V, just like we started before, and then put one down the middle, then all you have to do is hang a pair of wings there. And then there's our little French knot there once more. So here we are, we'll have just a quick little demonstration. There's our straight stitch. There's that second one there like that. Come down and no, we don't need that one. We're going to now with this one, you will see I've got that, I've got the first there, then I'm going to put in the second one there that just goes to the side. And again, a straight stitch, but shorter than we did the first two. Then here's our third one. 
And this, if you will remember, I said that this is once more those rabbit's ears, but it is a little bit longer. And we're just going to take that over there because we want it to be straight, giving it that like that. And last but not least, of course, that little French knot in the middle here. And we've talked about French knots before, just in that middle to give that little pansy an eye to it like that. So there's the first part of it done. Now we're looking at these, um, these daisies and there are various different ways of doing that daisies. These are probably the easiest ones of all. But what I want you to notice is that I'm not pulling the thread hard on the fabric like that. I'm just leaving it with a little bit of bounce like that. So there we are, we've got the first two there. Then we're going to put in that third one, which will come down like this. And we can just hold that firm so that it just means it's easier for me to manipulate things and keep it flat. There you will see I've got the, there's my three there. I've put in my fourth one there and I'm just going to put in that last one there. Um, and we're just going to let that bring it down like that. So there's my five little petals there. And of course you will have noticed that I was leaving a small hole in the middle. And this time I'm actually going to be putting that French knot. Now, when I did the sample up here, I used, I used, um, I think I actually used floche, but stranded cotton is fine, just whatever. With this one, because I had a nice big uh, hole there, I've used silk ribbon. It really doesn't matter what you fill that central hole with. Uh, I think a lot depends on the size of the the hole as to whether you use um, either and of course like so many times a lot depends on just the effect you want if you want a nice fat center to your flower or a very prominent center to your flower then obviously you would use some stranded cotton if you want just a small dot of color then you will use either floche or cotton abroder or stranded cotton, just whatever happens to be in your sewing basket. And sometimes that can be a very wary thing. <laughs> oh, well, most people that love embroidery have a little bit of something to put in the center with that wonderful French knot. Beverly, thank you so much for sharing your beautiful garments, your beautiful baby day gown and bonnet, and your wonderful techniques. And the thing that I think is most fun is that silk ribbon embroidery is easy. It is easy. And it covers a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Beverly, thank you so much. And now I'd like to share a piece with you from my vintage collection. This dress is one of my very favorites. If you will look with me, again, it's an early piece, the uh, mid 1800s, maybe even 1840 to um, um, 1880, but I'm gonna tell you why I think it's 1865. And by the way, it has a few little repairs, but I purchased it anyway because I love it. Now, what I really want you to look at is this exquisite skirt. There are 65 tucks on this skirt, and I just have to try to touch base with the lady that made this. I happen to believe this dress was made in 1865. Now, I may be wrong. Perhaps it was just the skirt looked beautiful with 65 tucks, but I just have a feeling that she was speaking to future generations, letting them know the exact date that this dress was made. This is a very inexpensive dress to make if you were going to make a dress with just tucks. It is exquisite, uh, very little, uh, trim, very little Swiss trim or very little lace to make a dress that is is a show-stopping dress. And I, one of the things I love about these clothes is I like to feel like I can identify with the women that spent so much time making these clothes well over a hundred years ago. Thank you for coming to join me in my sewing room today. I hope you've had fun. Now, I'd like to invite you back next time.